Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for today. We know that your word reveals not only your love, not only your grace, but reveals your wisdom. And we know that when we come in contact with you, you share of your wisdom with us. So we are praying that today you'll give us an understanding of true wisdom in Jesus' name. Impart your word and your knowledge unto us that we will live our Christian lives soberly and successfully. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. The whole chapter contains a part of the record of Paul and Barnabas obeying the Lord, carrying out their special assignment given by the Lord himself. It is easy to read these verses, only 28 verses, repeat the narrative, that is the story we have here, and pass on. One way or the other would have gained knowledge. A knowledge of what they did, how they did it perhaps, and what results they obtained from what they did. But we will not avert the benefit of sharing from the secrets of success in their lives. I told you last week that whatever a man is called to do, he needs some qualifications to carry him through, to actually get the work done. And you have found that in the world in which we live, you are placed in position by the qualifications you have. And even when you've got into that place of work, you are able to get on the ladder of progress and success by the qualifications to maintain in your life. And I told you that even though our areas of discipline, areas of knowledge, areas of study may be different, but actually we all need the same basic qualifications to be successful in whatever the Lord is calling us to do. In our Christian life, we need qualifications to be able to keep on the narrow way that leads to eternal life, that leads to heaven. As a Christian worker, we need qualifications. And the same thing as full-time ministers or missionaries on the gospel field, we need these qualifications. The major thing they did in this uh, chapter is that they preached. I don't know the major thing you are doing in your life, but whatever it is, all that they needed in the major thing they did, you also need in your life, in the major things you are called to do in life. Let's look at the chapter and just look at some verses to see what they did. Verse 1. It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. They spoke. That was a single um, thing that they did. But you know, if you are going to really carry out uh, preaching, you need all that God has given you. Not only things that are spiritual, but things are nat that are natural. You'll be amazed how your speech will be hampered if your sight is not good. You'll be amazed how your speech will be disturbed if there is a little sore on your tongue. You'll be amazed that your speech may be hindered or bothered if you have a little family problem, depression, stress, strain, some worries, some anxiety in your life if you are not totally free to live you know there are people that exist and they don't really live. If you are not really free to live, so much stress, strain, discouragement, past pain, or suffering. Many things on your life that weigh you down. Even though you may have the knowledge, you will not be free to actually speak. 
and you'll wonder in your life how major, major things in your life can be disturbed by the little, little things that happen in your life. And a little of, uh, you know, a little suffering physically, probably because you didn't take care of your health. How that will hamper your progress in life. But now it says the soul paid. No problem on their body, no problem in their mind, no problem with their neighbors, no problem anywhere. And they, they could be positive because there was no problem at all. If there were problems, they kept it far away from them, kilometers and miles away from them. They never saw it, they never thought about it. Therefore, they could so speak. I'm so concerned for you as a member of this church, as a child of God. I know that you have a single life to live. And that single life is so very short, just a few years, perhaps 70 years or 80 years. And out of the 70 or 80 years already, think about how many years have gone already. And those many years that have gone, we don't know what's on record, what has been done. But you know, from this very day, you can make up your mind that that life assignment God has for you, you want to carry it out, and you're not going to allow any encumbrance, any hindrance, anything that will tie your legs or tie your hands or weaken you, discourage you, depress you, weigh you down, burden you, overwhelm you, to hinder you from carrying out God's life purpose in your life. The soul speak. I'll come back to that again. Now verse 3. Long time therefore... You know, I discover that anybody that succeeds in life is able to stay on that one thing long, long time. And I find that human nature, we are not, uh, you know, easily bent to remain in the same place. You test yourself that you are going to stand up for just one hour, not bent, not look in various directions, just in one direction. And uh, all the time you are standing like that, make up your mind you are not going to talk to anybody, and you are going to think on only one thing for that one hour. Very, very difficult. It is not in human nature to remain stable, steadfast on one thing a long, long time. And you will discover in your life that your life career may not look very interesting to you. And yet, this is the very thing your life hangs upon. And at the end of life, you'll be surprised when you meet God face to face. One thing will be very, very needful. Just one thing, one assignment. We don't uh, dabble in this and dabble in this and dabble in that. That's what human nature likes. Human nature likes uh, experimenting, hobbies. Try this one, try this one, try this one. Jack of all trade, master of none. But you see, that is the way the human mind is. We are not able to stay and stand on one single solitary thing. Long time. We like experimenting. We like trying many things. But I'm showing you how you can succeed in your life. That if you're going to succeed, one, keep all the things that bring strain or stress, pain, anxiety, worry out of your life entirely. Make friends with people that they don't have, a, you know, the tendency of putting strange load upon you. A load which is not yours to carry. A load which is not part of your assignment from God. A body in which, uh, you know, is not part of the thing God is going to ask you any question about on the last day. I mean, something that doesn't concern you at all, doesn't concern me at all, is not part of what the Lord is requiring from you. And you know, there are people that just like to put a strange load upon you. And you will not be able to, you know, manifest all your qualities, the qualities in your life, in a straightforward manner that will make you effective and successful. And then... So try to, you know, just overcome this habit of, you know, trying this, trying this, trying this. Stay at one thing. Determine what God wants, to do, wants you to do. And long time stay on it. Long time, therefore, abode this speaking boldly. 
whatever you are going to do at all in life, make up your mind, you are going to do it boldly. Don't do anything that uh, you know you'll be doing and uh, looking back, somebody watching me, nothing must be wrong. But something you can do with confidence, with boldness, something you can do without looking back at all, something you can do with all your power, all your ability, all the fiber, all the intellect, and all the spirituality you have within you, boldly. Something you can do with 100% concentration that you will not have anything at all to look back to. That you will just say, there's one thing there is to do, and I'm doing it with all the strength that I have in my life, boldly. In the Lord, those three words. In the Lord. In the Lord. My brother, time is short. On the 6th of this month, that was my birthday. I calculated the number of days from that day until the end of 1990. I spread out all the days. You know what I discovered? Those days are not up to 2,000 at all. And I asked myself, 2,000 days, very, very short, very, very small, between now and 1990. And I cannot afford to waste a single minute of any single day because you know we're growing older every time you are older today than you were last year and time is running out look at when we woke up this morning a whole day before us look at where we are now the night is already around and within a few hours now everywhere will be dark will be asleep and tomorrow will come like that again the next day will come like that again. The next day will come like that again. Buckle up. Tighten your belt. Calculate the days ahead of you. Make up your mind. You are going to do something that has a measure, a value, something worth it in this single life that you have. And you know, they concentrated on just the single thing. And it says, they spoke in verse 3, boldly in the Lord. Don't let us waste time. Time is precious in the Lord. Do everything in the Lord. Then in verse 7. And there they preached. Paul, Barnabas, are you not tired of doing the same thing all the time? No. If we're ever going to succeed, we must do the same thing all the time. All the time. All the time. Mother, if you are going to succeed, bringing up that little child, you must change the dirty diapers all the time. You know, but the mother that changes, uh, you know, the dirty diapers uh, just one month and says, I'm tired, I want adventure, I want excitement, I want another thing, I want a change of environment, I want a change of responsibility. That mother will never bring up any child. Mother, you want the family to be happy, you must stay in that same kitchen every day. But you know, the woman that says, I want a change, a change of environment, a change of a family, a change of a assignment, a change of this, a change of that, that woman will never keep a stable family. You know, the pastor that says, you know, I want another church. I'm fed up with this one, seeing the same faces all my life. I want to be in another church. I want to do another thing. I want to go here. I want to go there. That man will never build a standing church as a pastor. My brother, my sister, stay at that job that God has given you. Stay in that family that God has given you. And put in all your strength. And whatever it is you find to do, do it with all your mind and do it over and over and over and over until you succeed. You know, every one of, here, of us here this evening, you have the ability within you to succeed. All it takes is stay at it. Do it now. Don't say I'll do it tomorrow. Do it now. Oh, the work is so large. You know what I've discovered? 
no matter how great a particular assignment may be, you can divide it into small, 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 small bits. Do a small part of it today. Tomorrow when you wake up, start on it again. A small part. Another day when you wake up, do another small bit again. When you wake up another day again, do another small bit again. Keep at it. Keep at it. And you'll finish in, uh, you know, some days, you'll finish a great, great world. But this is the thing that makes people not to succeed. They are not willing to stay at that same thing and do it over and over and over until the whole thing is finished. In verse 7, And there they preached the gospel. And in verse 15, Saying, Sirs, What do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that he should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are there in The word is there again, preach, or preach unto you. Verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city, they did it again. They preached again. And in verse 25, when they had preached the word in Paga, they went down into Atalia. I show you all these to tell you that perseverance wins the race before the end of the day. Not at the end of the day. If you persevere before the day runs out, the one that perseveres, he wins the race before the end of the day and you will be able to say I stayed there I stood by that thing I applied all that I had within me I thought I wouldn't make it but I kept on it I convinced myself there's no other thing to do if I leave this one and I do any other thing I'll be wasting my time wasting God's time wasting everybody's time Therefore, I will stick to this one thing, and I will do it. And I've told you that these things that applied to the apostles that were sent out, they applied to us as well, to every one of us. And I've told you that in this chapter we have qualifications that we're looking for, that will make anybody apostle, or prophet, or evangelist, or pastor, or teacher, or deacon, or Christian worker, or just um, a Christian, a church member, anybody at all will make such a person succeed. Now, let's see. Just three of these qualifications today. There are still many more as we get through the whole chapter. In um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, let's read from verse 1 to verse 3. And it came to pass in Iconium, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a multitude of the Jews and of also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their might civil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The very first qualification we have seen here is boldness. Now boldness is not being aggressive. There are many people that think you are bold when you are aggressive. Boldness is not um, making a lot of noise without content in the noise you are making. There are many people that feel that if you shout, then you are bold. Boldness is not being fast without carrying the baton. That is, you are running a race and you have not, uh, you know, taking the baton from the other person and then running with it and then you say, you know, shoot ahead without the baton in your hand. That's not boldness. That's foolishness. That's aimlessness. That's not having, a, you know, a concrete design or desire to even do anything at all. That's just a waste of energy. That's, uh, you know, drawing water out of the well and uh, pouring it into a basket. Boldness is knowing what the Spirit has said, knowing what the Lord wants you to do, and keeping at it, knowing that if he said so, if he sent me, nothing and nobody can hinder me. 
not looking at circumstances, but knowing God is behind me and before me and with me and within me. And is the one that is moving me along and I fear nothing. Now it says that they went forth. You see, as they went forth at uh, that time, the, many of the times they went to major, major cities to carry out the work the Lord wanted them to do. And now it says in verse 1, the soul spake. Now in the ministry of preaching, you'll discover this. You cannot preach the word and so speak without having confidence in what you are preaching. Therefore, the very first thing you want to understand is that if you are going to be a preacher and if you are going to really so speak until people be converted, both Jews and Gentiles, you must have confidence in the truth that you are preaching. There must be assurance that this thing you are saying, you really believe it wholeheartedly. There must not be a doubt at all in any corner of your heart concerning the doctrine of Jesus Christ, concerning the total teaching of the Bible, concerning the thing the Lord has sent you to, to preach for, to speak for. There must be that confidence and assurance. There must be co uh, conviction as well. You will not be able to so speak boldly, assuredly, convincingly if there is no conviction. But these were people that they had no doubt in their minds at all about heaven, about hell, about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit, about the prophecy that came out of the, you know, of the congregation and to tell them to send them forth, about their calling, about being sent, about everything surrounding the profession that God has put them into. There was no doubt at all. If you doubt your call, or doubt a message, or doubt life beyond the grave, or doubt the necessity and the sufficiency of Christ as Savior and Redeemer, you cannot so speak like that. But as it is true for the preacher, it's true for every other person, that your life calling, your life assignment, there must be that conviction, there must be that confidence, there must be that assurance within you that I am in the place I ought to be. And sometimes you know you are in the place you ought to be, but you have not uh, studied enough to be convinced. You have not prayed enough to be convinced. You have not asked God to be convinced this is a place. And when you have a little, little doubt, a little doubt in your mind, you cannot be your best. The Lord might have placed you there, giving you that assignment. And the Lord might have given you only that assignment for a lifetime. But if you have not, uh, you know, got so intimate with God to be convinced within you, to have confidence within you, assurance within you, and conviction within you that this is it. This is the way I ought to spend my life. This is the thing God wants me to do. This is the place the Lord has placed me, and this is the way I'm going to glorify God. If that assurance and confidence and conviction is not there, you'll not be able to so speak or so carry out that thing that it becomes successful. You know, even in our career, businessman, to really be successful, there must be that confidence and conviction and assurance that this is it. You know, not a person saying, well, I, I'm, I'm really confused. I don't know whether this is a business I ought to be doing or I ought to go and settle on another thing or I ought to go and do another thing. And uh, God, don't leave me alone like this. Talk to me. Let me know where I ought to be. You'll not be able to put 100% ability and concentration all you have into that business if there is that little doubt, nagging doubt within you. The same thing in our marriages. You need to be convinced beyond a shadow of doubt that already this is where you're married, you're here, in this family, in this home. And you ought to be convinced, my brother, my sister, that if that home or if that family is going to succeed, it's not an outside influence that will come into this family to make it successful. The people that are going to make the home or the family successful, number one, myself, number two, my partner. Those are the only two people. So don't look outside and feel, well, I hope so and so will help us so that this thing will be successful. Oh no, God has planted you there. Have that conviction within you and it will be successful. Make up your mind. 
A day single family. Don't be looking here and looking there. And uh, that uh, uh, sister's husband is better than my husband. You'll never succeed that way. That person's wife is more intelligent than my wife. You'll never succeed that way. I am here. I am here. This is my wife. This is me. No matter where we are now, even at the bottom of the ladder, both of us will have the ability to make this thing successful. And our minds are in no other places. Conviction, confidence, assurance, and the Lord is backing us up. We're going to make it succeed. That's how to succeed. That's how to do it. But looking here and there, watching for other people to come and make it successful, it doesn't happen that way. And in verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds civil affected against the brethren. Well, that's persecution, that's opposition, that's resistance. But God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. And with every temptation or trial, he will make a way for you to escape. Do you know that God has made a path for every feet to get to the top of the mountain? God has made it. You may find that there is a, you know, a hindrance on the way, trial on the way, temptation on the way, but there is a path around that temptation, beyond that temptation, above that temptation. And if you'll just open your mind, open your eyes, listen to God, you can still succeed. Nobody ever gets to the top of the mountain without some little, little, little difficulties. But God has made a way to go beyond that difficulty. Understand this. Every life that God involved, is involved in never terminates at the point of a hurdle or hindrance or a mountain. You watch the lives of people. If the life of an individual terminates at a hindrance, at a stumbling stone, a stumbling block, if the life of an individual terminates at the point of a trial or temptation, that person has not been looking at God. Because in all the plan that God has made, he never terminates his plan at the point of a hindrance. And if you're a real child of God, in whatever you are doing, in the church or in the world, whatever you're calling, whatever you are doing, your life does not terminate at the point of that trouble. Your life does not terminate at the point of that difficulty. But there is a path beyond that trial, beyond that temptation, beyond that opposition, beyond that persecution, and your life continues. And if you will look up to God, whatever trial you are having now, the plan of God goes beyond that trial. You'll go beyond it. And eventually, you know it will be wonderful if at the end of the whole thing, all of us as we are here tonight, and all our brethren who were here yesterday on Sunday, if at last we all meet on top of the mountain and we look at one another and we said, yes, we said so. That day when we were studying that Bible, when we were still in the valley and we looked up to the mountain and it looked very, very high, we told one another that day, our life does not terminate with a problem. We are up and we are going to the top. You know, it will be wonderful the day we all meet together like that on top of the mountain and say, thank God we made it. But we made it because we knew, we understood. Any life that God is involved with never terminates at the point of the persecution or opposition or difficulty. There is a path beyond that trial in front of you. So don't back out. Don't backslide. Don't say it's too much for me. I cannot bear it anymore. You can bear it. You don't know what you can bear. You can bear it. You know that uh, married woman watching another uh, woman that is laboring with birth pain, wanting to deliver a child. And that uh, young woman, looking at that, at the other woman that is laboring, said, ah, I will never make it. I can't make it. Is this what labor means? Delivering a child? Maybe God has given this person the ability, but I know myself, I'll never make it. And then she gets married. 
she gets pregnant and the day comes and she's afraid and afraid and afraid and afraid and within a few hours the child is born and then she looked at the midwife and said you know I thought I will never make it God has planted it in every woman to make it and in every life especially every Christian God has planted something within your heart that can make it to the top of the mountain you will make it no matter the trouble the persecution the opposition the trial you'll make it and the day is coming when you will look back and you will look at far far away things that have happened and you look up to God and say God you know I thought I will not make it and how wonderful it is I made it at last you will make it there was opposition persecution and the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles against these people and they made their minds evil affected evil affected against the brethren long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord don't let anything make you a coward let the gift within shine forth let it come out don't let that opposition or that persecution or that trial make you a coward. There is something within you, God has planted within you, that ought to grow and shine forth and come forth. And however the people have been opposed to you, opposed to your life, opposed to the great things the Lord wants you to do, long time remain at that job. It will be done. And you will be able to do it boldly in the Lord. And then we are told he gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted them signs and wonders to be done by their hands. He confirmed the word, the things that were done. Now, in verse 4, But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles some people say well if this thing is of God it will have no problem at all that's not true everything that has been of God from the time of Noah to the present day has been fought by the devil and fought by the agents of the devil and as you see what we're reading here, it was the Holy Spirit that spoke out. My brother, don't judge your life with the opposition of people. My sister, don't judge uh, the thing that the Lord wants you to do by the people that agree, by the people that don't agree. You know, people say, if this thing is of God, everybody will be smiling. They'll be saying, oh yes, isn't it wonderful? If these things are real miracles from God, everybody will just be in agreement. If this church is, you know, serving God and living by the precepts of the gospel and doing the things the Lord wants them to do, everybody in town, everybody in the country will be in agreement. No, that's not true. You know, the Holy Ghost speak and said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And they went forth to carry out the work of the Lord. And you see here there was division in verse 4. The multitude of the city was divided. Sometimes, uh, you know, you're preaching Bible doctrine. And um, people are divided on it. Some people say, oh, no, I don't agree. Other people say, yes, I agree. That's the word of the Lord. Then some people that are innocent, but simple-hearted, ignorant, of course, Oh, they will say, if this doctrine were of God, there will be no division at all. Everybody will just agree with that doctrine. My brother, my sister, it's not so. They were divided. And it has been like that from the time of Noah, I told you. You know, they were divided on the building of the ark. It was like that at the time of uh, Abraham. There was division there. Some on this side, some on that side. At the time of Moses, there are people even within the fold that said, no, Moses, you, you cannot be right. You didn't meet God. God didn't speak to you. You know, it was like that at that time. At the time of Joshua, haven't you read his life story? 
Elijah, David. You know, even the very son from the bosom of David said that he didn't agree with David at all. And said, if I were the king, I'll make a better king. And told the children of Israel that came to him and said, hey, look at this foolish old man. Look at what he's doing. I can do better if you put me there. You know, it has been, there. It has been like that all the time. Haven't you seen people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel? In fact, you know, at the time of Daniel, some people did not understand the things that God wanted him to do. They eventually put him in the lion's den. It was like that in the time of Jesus. Why are you surprised when people oppose you? As if this thing has never happened before. Why are you allowing people to weaken you by their tongue? You know God has given you a single life. And this single life, it must amount to something. And you don't want your life to just, you know, be like this and like this. You want to do something concrete by the power and the enabling, enablement of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. You don't want your life to just be, uh, you know, humdrum, lukewarm, uh, cold, hot, up, down, wishy-washy type of life. You want this world to be happy that there was somebody like you. And I'm telling you that at the end of life, your family at least can look at you and they can say, that's the best person this family ever saw in this family. It can be like that. In your own town, in your village, as they look at everybody that came from that village, they can say, by the grace of God, that person is the best person we ever had since the beginning of this village. Nobody ever knew God. Nobody ever did anything substantial in the name of the Lord, in the power of the Lord, like this person in our village. It can be like that. But, you know, people will oppose your life. I hope you are not allowing people to just, you know, run you down, discourage you tell you you are just a woman you'll never do anything in your life all those desires all those ambitions all those aspirations you know that's too much for you as a woman don't let them talk to you like that you tell them i'm a woman facially and bodily but there's somebody on the inside of me and greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world and you as a man don't let anybody tell you oh you are not educated you are not educated. You say, well, I am not now, but I'm going to be. I don't have to leave my work and go to university or go anywhere. I can study myself and read myself until I'm educated as I could be. You can. <laughs> you can. There is no limit to the man that determines in his life, in his heart, that his life is going to amount to something by the grace of God. The opposition cannot quieten that man. The man that has a vision of the Lord, fire in his soul, fire in his spirit, and a determination that this, my life, will do something concrete for the glory of God. It will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so in verse 5, And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, were the rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, that's to kill them, they were aware of it and they fled. Mark that word. They fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lies round about. I thought you said they were bold. <laughs> yes, my brother. But now they fled. Yes, they were bold, but they were not stupid. You know people that will stick out their neck and say, cut my neck, cut my neck. <laughs> Don't you want to live? Isn't success and progress ahead of you? Why are you putting your neck down and say, cut my neck, cut my neck? Hide your neck. You know some people that will say, I don't care if they kill me. No, you should care. We care. We need you. <laughs> if they kill you, who will do the work God wants you to do in this church? Who will take care of your family? If they kill you. Who will educate your children? And you say you don't care. Oh, you must care. I don't care if this happens to me, if this happens. Oh, no, don't say it like that. Be bold, but don't be foolish. Be bold, but have your eyes wide open, your ears open, your mind at large, and your feet active and agile. 
And when a man of God, when he needs to leave a particular place, that's wisdom. And get to another place, that man, that woman ought to do that thing. Now, let me show you in the Bible. That Jesus told his own disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. That's wisdom. A bold, living messenger or servant of God is better than a stupid, dead servant of God. Don't stick your neck out and say, I don't worry, I don't care, let them kill me. There's something for you to do. In uh, First Kings chapter 17, and in verses 2 and 3, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself. Elijah, very bold at the time, very powerful at the time, having great dynamic faith at the time, and yet, after he announced to Ahab, and said, according to my word, there shall neither be dew nor rain these years according to my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, Elijah, you have spoken out the word, and it's going to be so. Get thee hands, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook cherries that is before Jordan. That's wisdom. Boldness, yet wisdom. We ought to be wise. Look at Jesus Christ himself, John. John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because of the Jews that sought to kill him. Even Jesus Christ. In John chapter 11, verse 53 and verse 54. Then from that day, they, from that day forth, they two counsel together to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, because they sought to kill him, Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. There's wisdom in that. And even though we're bold, and we have the calling of God, we have the confidence in God, we have the vision of the Almighty, and we know that this single life, the Lord has a lot He wants to accomplish through my life and through your life. Let us join wisdom with boldness. Then in verse 7, And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had word. The same had Paul speak, who said firstly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he lived and walked. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Let me say something that will surprise you and challenge you. A person may never work a miracle in his life, and yet he may be a successful person. John the Baptist never performed a miracle. But there was nothing God wanted him to do in life that wasn't done. He did everything the Lord wanted him to do, to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. These were apostles, and the signs of an apostle were wrought. And as they were there in Lystra, they saw this man impotent. Remember, this was their calling. Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. 
for the work whereunto I have appointed them, I have assigned them. And part of the work was that miracles, mighty signs, and wonders will be done by these messengers of the gospel that were sent forth. There is an assurance you ought to have. Whatever the Lord wants you to do in life, everything will be done. If walking miracles is included, it will be done. If raising the dead is included, it will be done. If making the lame to walk, making the blind to see is included, it will be done. But let it be what God has assigned for you to do. But you know, when there is reaching forth to what is assigned to another person, and then you are leaving the work that is assigned unto you, and you don't do that one, there will be no success there. He preached the word. And as he preached the word, there was a lame man that was there. There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his speech. That is, he had been lame. Lame since he was born. Being a cripple from his mother's womb, he never, never had walked. The same heard Paul speak. In the Greek, Greek authorities tell us that um, the word heard is in the continuous. The same kept on hearing Paul as he was speaking. And Paul, at the, time, at the first um, time he got into that place, he did not go there and say, In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. When a man was not ready. When a man did not know that there was healing anywhere. When a man did not know there was a miracle. When the word of God had not been preached in that place, Paul waited. God may even want you to do that thing, but perhaps you need to do another thing before you do that. In our lives, we must learn to recognize the various steps that lead to the climax in our lives. But many of us want to jump at the climax, at the top thing, at the highest thing. And the various things that lead to that climax, we're not willing to do. But Paul kept on preaching. First message, and the man was there. Paul did not even pray for the man. He preached another message again. The Greek said that uh, the same was hearing Paul. The same continued to hear Paul speak. Who at a time? And Paul stopped and he steadfastly looked at him, beholding him, earnestly looking at him. And now he knew the man was ready. God is ready. The apostle is ready. A man himself that was sick, ready. The three in unity together, the miracle took place. And you know, there are times that uh, God is ready all the time. And perhaps the preacher might be ready most of the time. But the man at Lystra was not ready before that time. But he went on preaching, kept on preaching, kept on preaching, steadfastly beholding him. He knew this is God's time. Just looking at him, he stopped his message and stopped his preaching and said, The time has come. God is ready. I am ready. You are ready. Rise up in your feet and walk. And the man lived and he walked. I pray that in your life, you will watch for that time. When that higher step, that climax in your life, when God is ready, you are ready, the people are ready, that time you strike and a miracle will take place. Rise up and let us pray. Don't allow any excuse for failure. God has built you to succeed. And he has put everything you need for success within you. You're a Christian. You're born again. The one on the inside of you is greater than the one in the world. You will succeed. You will succeed. Yeah. You pray and tell the Lord, don't look at failure. Don't look at opposition. Don't look at problem. You will make it. Tell the Lord, whatever you put your hand upon, by the leading of the Lord, the guidance of the Lord, stay at it. Success is before you.